I'm Rosalie Ginevra. I'm the League's Executive Director. I'm very happy to welcome you to the fourth night in our series called The Housing System. Um, in earlier programs in the series, we learned about um, building and neighborhood maintenance, about small dwelling units and their history, viability, costs, and possible impacts. And last week, we learned about the various ways that the city and market-driven de developers and the nonprofit sector are approaching the potential promise offered by a variety of types of shared housing. Tonight, we're gonna to get a window onto how two other American cities with expensive housing markets, Los Angeles and Minneapolis, are taking action to address the availability and affordability of housing by challenging the regulatory frameworks um, that structure what can be built. And we'll talk about what kinds of lessons these efforts might offer to New York. Next week on Thursday, May 30th, um, the fifth program in the series is called New Methods and New Materials. And we'll hear from John Cerrone of Shop Architects, Sheila Kennedy of Kennedy Violich, and Craig Curtis from Katera, um, along with Mark Norman of the University of Michigan as the moderator. Then our final event in the series on Monday, June 10th, and um, please note uh, that that program begins at 4 p.m. It will be a conversation between Roseanne Haggerty, who's one of the most innovative thinkers and actors in the country on homelessness and housing, and Dr. Donald Berwick, who's a leader in rethinking um, issues in the healthcare system. They'll be talking about how to conceptualize and enact systemic change in complicated systems. I want to thank Emily Schmidt for her critical role in conceptualizing and organizing this series and all of the lead staff for helping make these events happen. Tonight's program called Rewriting the Rules is about the intended and unintended effects of the zoning and building codes that govern the way that we build housing about our current deference to the private housing market as the way to generate supply and about questioning the current system and coming up with alternative approaches to meet our vast need. You have biographies of tonight's participants in your printed programs, so I'll be brief in introducing our speakers. Our first presenter is Dana Cuff, an architect and architectural historian who created and directs the City Lab at UCLA, which is a policy and design think tank Dana is the co-author of a bill um, that passed the California State Assembly and that changed regulations to make accessory dwelling units permissible across the state. Our second presenter is Anton Schieffer, a member of Neighbors for More Neighbors, a highly effective advocacy group in Minneapolis that has played a major role in securing important regulatory changes um, in that city that will come out of the um, new 2040 comprehensive plan. And then we'll begin a discussion of the issues raised with responses to the presentations by Gianpaolo Baiocchi, director of the Urban Democracy Lab at NYU and primary author of the report, Communities Over Commodities, People Driven Alternatives to an Unjust Housing System um, that was put out by the Homes for All Campaign of the Right to the City Alliance and Fabiana Meacham, who is the Chief of Staff for the Office of Policy and Strategy at New York's um, Department of Housing Preservation and Development. So please join me in welcoming Dana Cuff. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. This is my first time speaking to the Architecture League, and I've known the reputation of the organization for decades and envied that we have nothing like it, really, in Los Angeles. Rosalie tells me that you want to know something about how I got into this work, and truthfully, I can barely remember. It's been going on so long. But here's a kind of autobiography that maybe would be the thread that leads to it, which is I began to figure out through writing as an academic what architecture practice was all about and how that uh, negotiations made innovation in design possible. I then realized I had to look at cities to really understand this, to see how politics of uh, design was working in cities. Why was it that we couldn't build more and more interesting? It seems so naive now, but um, that was really a research topic for me, why we couldn't be more innovative in our work, particularly related to housing. And then I realized if I didn't start practicing in some way myself, I wouldn't have another piece of uh, the puzzle figured out. And so I started City Lab with my colleague Roger Sherman at the time. Uh, we began the center in 2006. 
It's a research and design center at UCLA um, that generates all its own projects. It's not a community design center. And then most recently, I've been working on how to teach students to practice in new ways. And I'm not going to talk about that at all at this uh, lecture. So City Lab is really the origin of the work I'll talk with you about tonight, which is the ADU, or Accessory Dwelling Unit, what we call Backyard Homes Project. City Lab has four basic initiatives. Uh, they're somewhat geographically based. I think in a city like Los Angeles, which is the mother of sprawl, um, it's our duty to try to uh, address that question with the post-suburban city and what that might mean. We think of that as also being largely about sustainability and thinking, rethinking green in new ways, also about new forms of public infrastructure, and always with uh, the ultimate goal of new ways of achieving spatial justice. So this project, the Backyard Homes Project, which is the one Rosalie referred to, um, is one that I'll go through basically in the order that you see here, from the original idea through some of the research that we conducted to the development of prototypes and um, the writing of policy uh, and the implementation of that policy. And then I'm going to just show you what that's led to. Uh, I, this project started in 2008 with a kind of um, young architects, planners, and developers competition to come up with new ways to pro provide market rate housing through policy change. And that little competition has given City Lab a lot of work to do ever since. That happened in 2007. Um, so uh, our basic idea was really to double the density of Los Angeles. And when I began talking about that and saying that out loud, it caused people's hair to catch on fire in Los Angeles. The, the retort was, don't Manhattanize Los Angeles. Um, and as you can imagine, when I see that there's actually zero single family housing on the island of Manhattan, it's ironic that our putting two units per single family zone was seen as uh, an abomination. But we really did try to begin with a changing of hearts and minds. Um, I was trying to see how this work was already being done in the backyards of many, many households, primarily working class households across the city. Um, and we were already 10 years ago deeply in need of various forms of affordable housing with no public subsidy. So um, with those starting ideas, we undertook eight years of research. Um, I didn't know what stamina it might take to approach this project, but you can see here a kind of summary of what the conditions are in the generic in Los Angeles. Uh, that map is Los Angeles, the yellow being single family uh, zone, what is called the R1 in LA. And it's approximately 80% of the land there. Um, the, Single family zone really varies, and one of the things we studied were various kinds of lot types, and what you're looking at here is a lot in Pacoima, a small town at the northeastern edge of the city of Los Angeles that was originally zoned agricultural, and so you see these long, deep lots. And we realized that if we were gonna try and promote secondary units, we should go to the places where they were already being built and where the lot type would allow us to do so as easily as possible. So you can see, maybe I will use this after all. Ah, uh, yeah. This lot already has three secondary units, right? There's the original house and three more were built. All of that's done informally and illegally without permits. Um, so, in this research, we met a great deal of opposition. Um, it was mainly the loudest voices who were the most opposed. We um, went to a number of neighborhood councils, which I gather is the same as your community boards here, um, and tried to find out what the primary sources of resistance were. And ironically, 
there would be a lot of talk in the public meeting about why this was going to ruin the neighborhood. And then three or four people would always come up to me afterwards and say, how can I build one? And so there was this sense that everybody really wanted to do it, but no one could come out in public uh, and say so. We then went and surveyed neighborhoods and found that in some neighborhoods in Los Angeles, already two thirds of the lots had secondary units, which only led us to believe that this was a much needed and highly motivated practice that was already going on in an informal and indigenous way. Um, not only were large lots, the lots that we saw as the low hanging fruit for secondary units, uh, corner lots and alley lots were equally uh, viable since parking was one of the primary restrictions uh, to building any kind of secondary unit if we were gonna start passing policy. Um, there, we were looking for ways that we could do uh, parking and housing together um, most easily. And we thought maybe that all this time we're working with this uh, city level governance, uh, neighborhood councils and our city council members um, to try to uh, write legislation for the city of Los Angeles. And we thought that perhaps we could gain neighborhood support if we uh, gave back community amenities in some way that there was a collective gain as well as an individual gain. Um, so we invented, uh, this is work by Roger Sherman and Kevin Daly, architects, ways of greening the alleys. The city had a policy of greening. We have 800 miles of alleyways in Los Angeles. Uh, these would be units that would help both uh, environmental sustainability on the alleyways as well as populating and giving security to the alleyways. The corner lots were seen as places that you might have uh, preschools, uh, better bus stops, anything that would turn its face out to the neighborhood in order to gain permission to build a secondary unit. And we also looked at ways you might control the growth of secondary units in a neighborhood. Um, the fear was that once the finger was taken out of the dike, every backyard would have a secondary unit, which in some neighborhoods they already did, no one knew, um, and that that would cause tremendous traffic problems. So we were inventing policies that would allow neighborhoods to have local control. For instance, San Diego set up a law that at 25% of the lots, the neighborhood would max out. and. That gave people the confidence to pass a law for secondary units um, in spite of the fact that no neighborhood had ever hit 25%. So the conclusions we did gained, if I had to summarize them from this first body of research, was about the types of sites that made sense, that the primary barriers, which is what we were really looking for to secondary units, was the parking requirements uh, and a set of development restrictions, which as those of you who write code or know about zoning ordinances, were extremely arcane. And so it took a lot of uh, digging into the weeds to figure out just what was uh, gonna get in the way if we decided we would enable secondary units. Some of them were related to the kinds of fire engines that were available at the turn of the century in Los Angeles. Um, you'd think that would be easy to remove, but it had become one of the means by which neighborhoods were resisting increased development. Uh, so upon seeing how um, undemocratic the local control of the neighborhood councils was, we realized we might need to work at the state level rather than the city level, and I started um, badgering our local congressman who invited me to organize an affordable housing expert panel. Um, and uh, upon doing so, we gained access to working at the state level policy. And we also were um, at the same time trying to develop design prototypes. And I'll show you uh, the one that we worked on really as an architectural project for the longest time. Uh, this again was with Kevin Daly Architects. It, almost all the work that we do in City Lab is uh, collaborative work with architects, planners, and developers. This was a vacuum sealed sandwich panel um, that would uh, be molded around a bent pipe frame. Um, it was intended to be 
easily to assemble, low cost, and very flexible, that you could kind of DJ in a program and site for the uh, various kinds of backyards that we found. One of the conclusions in the research was that there was no standard lot in Los Angeles, contrary to what everyone thinks, and there was neither a standard lot nor a standard backyard, that they were much more like thumbprints, and so we were trying to find types in that same sense. We then decided to try to build one of these, and what I'm going to show you is something that we call the buy home, um, uh, named after uh, the idea that it would really be built in the backyard as a bi thinking of the backyard as a biome, a microbiome. It's a one-to-one -one model of a work of architecture. It's not an actual habitable building. Um, I think the thing that I would like to point out as you watch this little time-lapse video is that uh, this building system uh, could be dialed into a wide range of conditions, just like the prototype that you watched in the GIF. Um, and by unskilled labor, this is my students, um, and it was intended to be able to be recycled, uh, dismantled, reused, and leave no trace in the backyards. The thing that I found most um, relevant, especially as an architect and urbanist, was that this extremely small increment could have extra large implications. And the implications, as um, Rosalie intimated, were that we could um, really end the era of the single family home <laughs> uh, and double the, by doubling the density of that same area. Instead of a man's house is his castle, we could um, replace that symbolic logic with a domestic sphere is for sharing. Um, and the idea was that every household we encountered had some form of a backyard home's story. Uh, it would be either a extended family, extra room, a place for nannies, for children returning home, for elder care, uh, not to mention uh, rental revenue streams. And all of this had the effect of stabilizing neighborhoods rather than causing further displacement, which was one of the problems that we are now seeing in actually new ways in Los Angeles. Um, I would say that this is basically the secondary unit legislation that I'll describe next is the most significant transformation of the urban landscape since post-war suburban sprawl. And it really is the onset of a post-suburban city. I think you get the idea. Uh, we had to get a, a shrink wrap instead of the um, vacuum envelope, but uh, it performed pretty much the same. So uh, with a, a lot of work as well as being in the right place at the right time, uh, I co-authored the Assembly Bill 2299, which incorporated all the research we had done. And I um, would argue that the architectural research that we undertook was absolutely essential to making this bill as effective as it has seemed to be. This bill was passed by the governor in late 2016 and became law January 1st of 2017. Um, it reduces parking to zero if you're near a transit area and by so doing, it uh, enhances our recognition of transit as being an important part of our city's landscape. It removed uh, the development barriers as many as we could. Um, it increased the types of ADUs permitted, which were not only garage conversions and new construction, but units that are carved out from existing houses with a new door to the exterior provided. And it incentivizes secondary units through by right entitlement. The impact of this has been profound and could be even greater. If there are 460,000 single family lots in LA, there's 1.5 million in the county and almost 8.1 million in the state of California. The data that I have at the moment uh, is that 2,000 ADU building permits were pulled 
in the first year, 2017, and 4,000 were pulled in the first nine months of 2018. This is actually quite a bit more than anyone expected. And understanding of this law is only now coming into place. So strangely enough, City Lab has become, a, which is in the basement of an academic building, has now become a kind of uh, info center for all the people who work at UCLA who are thinking about coming at building an ADU. So I have a stream of uh, staff and secretaries, it's fantastic, uh, people who want to build an ADU and can't quite figure out how. Realizing that that was the case, City Lab also wrote the guidebook for how to do this for homeowners. Um, it's a guidebook that now the city distributes, as do we, it's all online. Uh, what it takes to actually go through this complex process that most homeowners neither want uh, to undertake nor have ever done so before. And I'm not gonna talk about this now, but we also undertook a study of the new service providing um, and uh, technologically enhanced provision of services that architects, builders, and uh, city, uh, people who are informed about city processes are doing together so that more of these um, are being built with even investment capital. So to conclude, I'll just show you what our next steps are, the next yards we're looking into, which is schoolyards. Um, again, it's a, the same process of moving from idea through research to prototyping policy and implementation. We're really at the beginning of this now, but the idea is that there's more free land to be had for housing in the city, just like backyards were basically without land cost, theoretically, publicly owned schools are also um, having, would be free land where there would be potentially the incentive to build affordable housing. Um, these are public sites, so the housing, uh, restricting it to affordable housing is also more possible than it is in the backyard homes case. Um, and uh, we're looking at all levels of school sites. Turns out Los Angeles Unified School District has 1,100 schools, and it's the second largest landowner in the city after Metro. Um, so we started developing, again, site typologies and site strategies. Uh, this happens to be for an elementary school. Site strategies include taking away temporary classrooms, replacing those with the kind of facilities that the communities would want, so there would be a community benefit, a school benefit, and a housing benefit. Um, we then partnered with the community college system in Los Angeles to help them see how vast amounts of their land might be turned into housing for their uh, ill-housed students. Community colleges now are required, for example, to provide safe parking for overnight housing since so many students live in their cars. Um, and when you look at a, a college campus like this one, which was originally planned to train farmers, not something we're doing that much of anymore, um, there is a possibility of using that land in ways that would be much more valuable. And then I realized my own uh, schoolyard really was a, a much easier and lower hanging fruit uh, to, to begin and trying to see how our own students and student populations uh, housing needs might be better met. The primary uh, dorms at UCLA, like in most campuses, are for the 18-year-old who's willing to triple up um, and uh, live away for home, from home for the first time. And of course, that doesn't really match the student population any longer. Um, so we're doing research in sites, populations, and op architectural opportunities at the moment. Uh, the, Two populations we're particularly focusing on at this moment are super commuters, of which there's a growing group who commute more than 90 minutes to campus each day and therefore can't really get back home at night if they have an afternoon class in time to get back to school in the morning. So they need something more like a youth hostel. Um, housing insecure students, those students who have not known where they were going to sleep at least once in the past month, which makes up 30% of our student population, and non-traditional students, students who are coming back to school, veterans, formerly incarcerated students, students with children, and this is a population of students that we are increasingly uh, wanting to attract but can't help with housing. Um, 
So we're working with Herman Miller, uh, whose action office is now being thought of potentially as a dorm possibility, that we might be able to develop uh, flexible and transformable furnishings that would allow more students to live in smaller areas but with greater uh, peripherals like study rooms, kind of like the office is working now. Um, and next generation dorms uh, that would be uh, serving some of these wider populations. So after 10 years of research into backyard homes, we built a prototype, published articles, and received a lot of press, passed legislation, increased our credibility in the housing space. And the success of the California ADU bill was due in large part to City Lab's architectural research and that of some of our colleagues at UC Berkeley, which argues that transformative policy now, today, requires intricate spatial understanding because the post-suburban city is really a tapestry of material conditions, that finding patterns in those material conditions is really based on architectural problems. So if the Backyard Homes Project took me 10 years, I'm sure the Schoolyard Project will take me a similar number of years, and I hope you'll invite me back to talk to you about that. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Anton Schieffer, and I want to uh, thank the Architectural League for having me up here. Um, I'm from Minneapolis. How many, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of Minneapolis 2040? Okay, I mean, some, but not all. That's, you know, totally fine. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Neighbors for More Neighbors. We've been advocating on behalf of um, increased density and, and several other things that resulted in the Minneapolis uh, 2040 Comprehensive Plan, which has um, eliminated single-family zoning, among other things. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, our activism and kind of how we came to be. I promise this is the most uh, text-heavy slide that I have. <laughs> um, but we, we um, kind of started as a small informal group advocating for um, more housing for a variety of reasons. Uh, one thing is as a way to correct some of the historical wrongs um, that, have, that have happened uh, in terms of, um, if you're aware of the history of zoning, a lot of that is rooted in redlining. So that's one thing that we saw as a um, primary source of um, some discrimination that's happening now, as well as uh, Minneapolis also had a, a history of racial covenants, which, which I'll get into as well. Um, Neighbors for More Neighbors is also, is also, uh, was also started as kind of an anti-gentrification uh, movement in terms of we are trying to make sure that not all new housing is built strictly in low-income areas. Those low-income areas were traditionally um, zoned for multifamily housing. And over time, uh, single-family housing has led to um, exclusionary zoning so that, um, you know, preventing uh, new homes from being built in those single-family areas. So um, more housing being needed in high-wealth areas is um, one reason we've uh, got together. There, there, there are several others. Uh, when it comes to uh, access to walkable neighborhoods and transit, that's something that doesn't happen a lot in Minneapolis. Um, we're... You know, it's kind of funny being up here after um, seeing uh, talk about Los Angeles and uh, being in New York. Uh, we need to step back a little bit and just say that, so Minneapolis is a population of, in 2010, of 380,000. And in uh, 2018, our, our stats just came back. We're just shy of 430,000. So that's roughly, I want it, it's over 10% um, growth just over the last eight, eight years. And... Traditionally, I mean, we're, we're trying to make sure that that growth is happening in a way that uh, doesn't, you know, increase sprawl um, and, and that is environmentally sustainable as well. So, that, so creating those walkable neighborhoods is really important. In Minneapolis, we only have a handful of, of walkable neighborhoods where people can do things like get groceries, um, you know, walk to work, uh, those sorts of things. So one thing we were really focused on um, was allowing more of those things to be built. Um, so fighting climate change is, is a part of, of what we're about as well. Um, as, well as, as well as creating a variety in terms of housing choice. So a lot of these uh, exclusionary uh, neighborhoods that are strictly single family zoning, 
you know, we, we, we were thinking about when people start to age out of some of those homes, you know, where are they gonna go? A lot of people like to stay in their neighborhood and when you have a single family home, you know, as, as you get older, you can't do the maintenance, there's upkeep to, to be done and people wanna downsize. And unfortunately in, in a lot of these neighborhoods, there was no place that they could go to and stay in their neighborhood. So one thing behind um, some of the upzoning, so, so um, as part of Minneapolis 2040, we've eliminated single family zoning and we're, we will soon allow um, triplexes to be built across the city. So one you know, potential avenue for, for that is that um, someone could, could stay in their neighborhood and have a different home that they might not have to do um, upkeep with. So, so in terms of um, our organizing, so you can see our, our, our vision up here, uh, we had a kickoff in 2018 and um, we, had, we had a lot of people attend that and uh, a lot of kind of energy around that. Um, one other thing I wanna point out too is that um, vacancy rates in Minneapolis have been around 3% for most of the decade. So rents have been steadily rising um, over time as well as um, uh, home prices have been rising over time as well, uh, pretty rapidly. I know that um, I think the, the median you know, home, home sale price is, is, is around $280,000 as of right now, which again, might not seem like a lot of money uh, in, in other cities, right? But um, in Minneapolis, th th it, you have to, think that this has um, risen significantly over time, um, just like uh, our, our population has, has risen. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about, this is a, these are three maps of South Minneapolis and we can um, kind of look into how the history of redlining has impacted zoning today. Um, the, the areas that are, that are in red and yellow on um, this map, uh, I mean the red, the, these are from the uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, the, the bank that, that um, w w where lines were drawn in terms of where they would offer loans to. So the red areas were areas that, uh, where loans were uh, basically not allowed and yellow were, were less restrictive and uh, the red or the blue and the teal um, you know, ended up being, um, well, lar largely single family zoning, but um, also historically, um, lo loans were allowed in those places historically. Uh, the, the middle map, you can, you can see the um, history of the restrictive covenant. So Minneapolis had a, a deep history of, um, you know, writing into deeds that you would not, you not sell properties to uh, people who were non-white. So this also impacted a lot of um, areas, especially kind of in, in the deeper south of, of Minneapolis. I'll note that these maps are, um, are south Minneapolis and that this is, uh, th th there's also north and northeast Minneapolis which are kind of cut off just to um, concentrate this, this in one place. So um, again, often the, the areas that allow multifamily housing were, were close to downtown um, and our current zoning map um, also used to have a little bit more uh, green, um, the, the deep green, which is, or the, the, the light green on the, on the map is um, the single family zoning as, as you get kind of the, the deeper green. Um, those are some of the multifamily places. So um, just as one example, and um, th this did eventually, so one reason I got into this was, just kind of going back for a second, that um, I kind of assumed that uh, the redlining stuff had happened in the past and this was something that had um, happened a long time ago and that was impacting zoning today, but I didn't really fully understand you know, how this continued to keep people out of our city. So um, in 1975, uh, Minneapolis passed um, kind of an, an apartment ban anyway on, in areas that are closest to our, our downtown core. So as you can see on this map in uh, 1972, you know, the two areas that are on the right are zoned R6, which is our, um, high, which is our highest residential um, uh, permissible zoning anyway. So those were uh, buildings that could be up to, I wanna say five or six stories. Usually um, at the time uh, when, when, when these were being built, these types of buildings were the two and a half, un, um, 
floor walk-ups. So really three-story buildings that um, were largely being rented and um, which some neighborhood ho homeowners uh, did, did not like. And so they got together and changed some of these, uh, th these zoning um, maps into something that looks more like this, which is kind of a, a more of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, all the existing R6 properties were carved out and the R2B designation is, uh, only allows for duplexes in this area. Um, this is one of the most uh, highly walkable neighborhoods that's in Minneapolis right now. And so these types of things, um, you know, uh, this, this is the Whittier and the Wedge neighborhoods, by the way. Uh, these types of things really reduced the amount of new housing that could go in, in into these uh, areas. And uh, one other thing from um, getting into this, I'm not, a, I'm not an urban planner by trade, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist. And so I, I've come across a lot of these things kind of or organically, I think, but uh, understanding the, the impact that this has 30 and 40 years later is really significant because that's when Housing starts to become, uh, you know, what we call naturally occurring affordable housing, uh, housing that's aged over time. And so, after 1975, that kind of the, the the cap was in place. And so, you know, 30 and 40 years later, we're really feeling the effects of this because there is no naturally occurring affordable housing. So, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what Neighbors for More Neighbors did as part of our engagement strategy. Um, Obviously, if you've gone out and tried to you know, talk to ac activists about zoning, it's not always something that's natural or easy to talk about. Um, it's not something that people have a, a passion for. Obviously, this room is probably excluded. Um, <laughs> but we did several things to um, kind of go out and engage with people. So the city made it possible to run um, like a meeting in a box, for example, where they would present questions. We could kind of go in and, and have our, our a group discussion. We would have maybe a dozen or 20 people talking about some of these ideas that were important to us and kind of bouncing ideas off each other and understanding um, what other people's priorities were, what our priorities were, and where things fit together. Um, it comes to fitting together things like housing and transit, for example. That's one, one thing where some people are very passionate about uh, one, but maybe don't think about how the other fits in. Or when we talk about road design, um, you, you might be, be passionate about transit, but not really thinking about how um, roads can be, how, how road design impacts that. Um, so we did that. Uh, the city of Minneapolis offered online comments so we, so we could um, get together and have little comment parties. This is a picture from one where it's the same kind of thing. We'd, we'd get together, bounce ideas off each other, and it, it was really important to us to be social. Um, getting people together in a room to talk about this is not always easy, but it is. it makes it more easy when we can all um, talk about the idea that we have for a, a shared community. We also uh, made an effort to use uh, welcoming language, which is something that I think we can all probably do a little bit better. I mean, talking about, um, you know, just, just using terms like homes instead of, you know, units or development um, really helps bring in people who don't uh, talk about this on a, on a regular basis. In terms of uh, the city's engagement, um, they went through what I would consider probably the largest engagement in history, uh, in, in, in city history, not in like, humankind history. <laughs> uh, outreach was, you know, over at least 100 meetings um, and a lot of going out to where the community is. So they would go out to uh, street festivals or they would have specific dialogues with various communities uh, aimed at talking about what, they, what, what the community wanted to get out of um, the, this long-term plan. And again, um, they, they, they did um, meeting in a box and they did online, had uh, interpreters. And one thing they didn't do was do things kind of in a more what I consider a traditional way, which is going out to a neighborhood organization and getting back uh, information. The, the, the city went out to people who had not been traditionally engaged and went out to them and said, you know, hey, how do we, how do we better engage with you and not just, um, you know, relying on a neighborhood organization to provide that information for them. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what uh, Minneapolis 2040 is. So um, 
the Met Council is a regional, gover uh, regional governing body that covers uh, Minneapolis, and they require uh, each city to, to file a comprehensive land use plan every 10 years. Um, in the past, these hadn't been, there hadn't been a lot of engagement around these, um, but the city of Minneapolis really decided to, to step up and that they wanted to reach out to the community and better understand what the, what the uh, city should look like in 2040. Uh, there were over 100 policies in this, um, in, a, in a document they created. Um, just some of the, hi the highlights, I think, the, the thing that got the most uh, media attention, of course, was the um, single family zoning being eliminated. But we've also did some work to uh, reduce parking requirements and uh, implement uh, complete streets. So prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists and transit over uh, cars was actually a, a pretty big um, step that uh, we took. So um, I, I want to just put it out there that no, none of this is like technically official yet. So our, our eventual, um, the way the comprehensive plan works is that you create these plans and then over time your zoning code will ch uh, change and other codes will change to um, accommodate the plan. So we're, we're still in the process of that. Um, in terms of policy success outside of 2040, so there have been a lot of things that are included in a comprehensive plan, but um, we've done things outside of there as well. Um, unlike in, you know, I, I know that uh, Los Angeles had some difficulty, but we, we've, we legalized ADUs in 2014. Um, there have been, I think, a, around 150 of them built. So obviously this isn't, hasn't been a, a big, um, in terms of quantity, you know, the, the ADUs haven't um, haven't created you know this this uh, influx of, of new housing, but it certainly has alleviated uh, some of the growing pains in certain areas. Uh, we also reduced parking requirements near high fre frequency transit, so uh, allowing in tw in 2015 we allowed uh, developers to build. I believe it's it's roughly a, a half a unit of um, parking per unit built. So I'll go, I have a few examples of those um, I can go through as well. More recently, uh, we've finally passed an inclusionary zoning policy. So requiring new developments to um, have, I, I believe it's 10% of units be affordable to a certain uh, percentage of the area median, median income. Um, right now it's, it's an interim policy and we're working on a more um, uh, long-term strategy as well. Um, we have a, a a renter's first policy, one of the, some of the things that came up during the Minneapolis 2040 discussion was um, a lack, so uh, Minneapolis is preempted from uh, engaging in rent control in any way, and Minneapolis also allows for uh, no cause evictions. And so these are two things that um, we were unable to do much at the state level for, but uh, we've passed a renter's first policy to, um, put renters kind of at the forefront of decisions going forward. Uh, it was only very recently that uh, Minneapolis now has over 50% uh, renters as opposed to homeowners. That, that was uh, fairly recent, so. Uh, we've increased our affordable housing investment um, in, in engaging in plans like, um, programs like Stable Homes, Stable, stable Schools, which uh, aims to increase educational uh, opportunity for um, children who, who's, who are uh, facing homelessness. And one thing that came up uh, just recently, last week, um, in, kind of in the news, and this is, this is part of the implementation of the comprehensive plan was uh, banning new drive-throughs. Um, I'm in favor of this, and um, they're kind of a, a hazard to pedestrians, and as part of our uh, complete streets um, plan, it uh, means prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists over uh, automobile traffic. And this is, um, we, the, in 2015 was when, uh, was when we passed some, the, um, the ordinance around uh, the reduced parking requirements near, near high frequency transit. In the long term for the comprehensive plan, we, we will eventually be uh, reducing and hopefully eliminating parking requirements throughout the city. But we uh, focused on transit first, just to kind of make sure that, um, you know, th things were gonna work, work out well and it's, it's kind of a, a trial run. So we've had a few uh, new types of projects that have, that have gone up recently. Um, 
allowing uh, 75 homes and 32 parking spaces in one and uh, 49 homes with 20 parking spaces in another. So these are a couple examples of things that would not have been possible um, you know, even just a, a few years ago where uh, parking requirements were closer to one to one uh, where we offered some kind of um, incentive as well. A um, couple other examples here. Um, some other things that, that are happening in our city. Um, we have uh, light rail transit as well. And um, we, we've been like slowly, slowly uh, adding dead city near those uh, transit stops. We also have plans to roll out more of that. Um, we're also starting to roll out uh, arterial bus rapid transit as well. Um, Minneapolis also has lots of bike lanes. I think the plan is to have 30 miles of protected bike lanes in uh, by 2020, um, which relative to our city size, which is I think about 50 miles squared. I'm gonna look that up later and it's gonna be wrong, but I think that's about wh where we are. Um, so th that's another thing that we've, we've been focusing on. Um, I'm running out of time, but that's, I'm, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, political organizing being kind of part of the uh, foundation uh, for this outcome. So this is the 27, so 2017 um, Minneapolis City Council. There was a lot of political organizing uh, going on like for this election. A lot of people worked on a lot of campaigns and a lot of housing ad advocates, including Neighbors for More Neighbors, kind of before we were known as that name. Um, we, we put out questionnaires and tried to make sure that we had all these candidates' positions on housing uh, before, before the uh, primaries so that people could make an informed decision on who to, who to be uh, supporting in that. So uh, we also have uh, Our Streets Minneapolis is a group that puts on um, an event called Open Streets. I'm sure you probably have something like Open Streets here where you close streets to uh, cars and kind of let people into them and to occupy that space. I think that's been really valuable for getting people to understand um, what, what, what a city can look like. Um, and Streets.mn and Wedge Live have also uh, produced a lot of good work. Uh, Streets.mn is kind of a, is a community uh, blog basically, but it's read by a lot of policymakers and um, it's kind of a, a bit of the intersection of urban planning and uh, policy. And uh, Wedge Live, has been, I can't really say enough good things about Wedge Live, um, but really a, a positive, they're, they're a Twitter account and a YouTube channel and uh, have really done a lot for, um, for a adding to the discussion anyway. And I sh can't believe I got this long without talking about Lisa Bender, who is our uh, progressive uh, city council president, who was elected in 2013 and now is uh, city council president in 2017. A lot of the things I brought up on those previous slides are uh, directly a result of her. So if you are um, an urban planner or an architect and you're passionate about uh, these kinds of changes, um, I encourage you to run for office. Um, here's a, this is actually directly from Wedge Live just to kind of talk about uh, a summary of um, 2040. Um, we've had a, a courageous visionary leader, um, elections, a uh, large engagement effort, I didn't really talk too much about our um, clown car, our quote unquote clown car full of comic book villains in opposition, uh, but they, they existed and um, they you know, kind of wore out their welcome, I think among uh, elected officials. Um, but uh, some of the talk around uh, the fourplexes and triplexes um, really distracted from some of the other really positive things that we did. And so I wanted to highlight some of those. So um, with that, I think I've definitely gone over my time. So thank you. So uh, as Rosalie mentioned, I, worked at, I work in uh, city government at the Department of Housing. So um, I think my response will kind of reflect that experience for better or for worse. Um, but I think, I mean, in both of these presentations, um, draw kind of inevitable questions about how is New York City similar to Los Angeles and Minneapolis um, and how are we different and what does that mean for how some of these strategies might work here um, or how they would be modified. I think it's clear that um, at the root of a lot of 
these challenges is that we all face an affordable housing crisis, um, which at least in New York is, is occurs for a variety of reasons, but um, primarily because we know that our population has grown much faster than our housing production has been able to keep pace with. Um, and so that's created a situation where we have a dire need for affordable housing and are really, um, in this administration, focused on um, expanding our production as much as possible, both in new construction and preservation. And so I think a lot of our approach to where the city should grow new housing and develop new housing um, is kind of guided by that. Um, and so because we also have a lot of high density neighborhoods in the city, which serve um, a broad range of incomes from the highest income New Yorkers to the lowest income, everyone lives in some form of high density housing or has an opportunity to, um, that we tend to focus on those types of neighborhoods when we think about where to produce new housing and new affordable housing. Um, and that's kind of been the focus of our housing plan. Um, also because we have as of right development and have a lot of tools that use like the private market, um, private development and attach affordable housing requirements to that. So I think uh, for that reason, we tend not to um, think about lower density or single family neighborhoods as much as a resource for creating new affordable housing. I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, but I think both of these presentations kind of raise questions of how we could be doing that better or doing that more. And I think there's a lot of reasons why we could be doing that, which we can, we can talk about a little later, but you know, access to um, you know, certain neighborhood amenities, which we might find in, in single family neighborhoods being one of them, um, particularly for lower income people. Um, the other question that this raised for me was really, I think, on the um, Minneapolis example, is I think it's remarkable that um, you were able to get buy-in from your local elected officials um, and community residents. I think, you know, being in government, that is a huge challenge that we face every day, and um, I don't know that we've come up with any great solutions for that, other than we we do what we can and try to engage neighborhoods as much as possible around um, the issue of, of new development and new housing. Um, but I think we would certainly benefit from learning more about what strategies were effective um, and how to kind of move beyond the uh, people wanting to put walls up around their neighborhood and not really recognize like a broader citywide need for, for new housing. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. I really appreciate being at the metaphorical table to have this discussion with you today. Um, I was, so I'm, my comments are going to be a little bit different, but a couple of questions to both of you and maybe questions for all of us on the theme of the housing system writ large. Uh, I was thinking about the U.S. housing system as we were doing, I was listening to the presentations today, and I was thinking very broadly about some of the things that makes things different here compared to OECD countries, for example. One is that we have this interesting sort of jurisdictional issues that are, are, are quite distinct. So in the US, localities actually have a lot of room to experiment. So even though they have less ability to raise funds that are more dependent on local tax revenues and are, uh, often have unfunded mandates, so the, at the very best, you have very interesting experiments in LA, in Minneapolis. Some of the pol I love the policies, uh, some of the policies that you were able to achieve in Minneapolis. And I really love, I was thinking the whole time about the ADUs, about this phrase about unlocking the social value of land. Not just unlocking the monetary value, but looking look, the communal value of land, of unlocking the communal value of public land. You know, what good is a giant you know, parking lot compared to housing for students. So I, I thought there was some really wonderful. At the same time, I heard in both of your presentations some issues about, well, you know, is the neighborhood council the right side or do we have to go to the state? Is the city council, which is progressive, the right place or do we have to go to the state? Uh, you know, recently, as you maybe know, people, uh, went, caravans went to Albany 
to try to uh, push uh, this uh, rent control issues at the state level, which is where it resides. And in New York, in New York State, we have a peculiar system where we have a state senate that receives funding and donations from real estate interests in New York City, so it's difficult to move the needle at the state level. Um, so anyways, I wonder if you might talk about th these issues of local democracy, uh, jurisdictional issues, how you intersect with them. I, I would love to hear about the, both stories to me had elements of the kind of like, I, I don't know if you can say this anymore, unlikely bedfellows, are you okay to say that, uh, is that okay phrase? But you know like odd, <laughs> right? I don't know, okay. I teach, I'm often, uh, I'm, I'm correcting, corrected all the time, but you know, I mean in, in the most non-triggering, sexually suggestive way possible, but like <laughs> both stories had, uh, both accounts had stories of unlikely allies coming together around problem solving. And what little I know about Minneapolis and LA, and I know about the Bay Area struggles around this, is there are plenty of those. I would like to hear some of that. The second question I had for both of you, and you know, just I have to ask this question about housing system, is where you come down on the issue of public housing or non-market housing. Because one of the things that makes the US distinct is the small percentage of housing that's outside the market. And one thing that we do know is that portions of the housing, of housing stock being provided by non-market puts a downward pressure. Right, so the UK, for all the problems in social housing they have, has 20% of their population living in social housing, which affects the market differently. So that was my second question. Yeah, and, and I can kind of talk about uh, both those things. Well, uh, let me address the second question first. Um, in Minneapolis, we, we absolutely need more public housing. Um, and some of these like upzoning up um, across the city is uh, allowing some of that public housing to potentially be built in areas where it's traditionally not been built, which is uh, exclusive areas um, that are strictly single family, um, that are currently st single family zoned um, to that extent. So I, so I think that's definitely um, something that needs to be part of the discussion. And I think that um, non-public housing, e even the, the naturally occurring affordable housing, that will never become so affordable that it reaches those people who need the public housing. So understanding those two things that uh, they work in conjunction, uh, I think is important. Um, as to, to your first question regarding the um, you know, <laughs> the strange bedfellows, I guess. Um, our, our city council did pass the comprehensive plan by a vote of 12 to one. Uh, we had a mayor who, uh, during his, his uh, speech, when he was announcing he was running for mayor, he like stood up on a bar and uh, he said, you know, yes in my backyard. Um, so I think, yeah, it was, it was a little strange. I, I was there, it was um, strange, but, um, and, and while he didn't really, he wasn't really as outspoken about the plan in public um, as some other uh, council members were. Um, I think there was an understanding among the rest of the council that this is something that's important and this is something like a, a challenge that we're facing and it's something that we need to get action on and we can't just uh, shove it aside. And I think too many places right now are willing to uh, kick the can down the road and say we can deal with this at some other point when uh, the best time to deal with it is, is right now. I'm, I'm curious, did, you, your, did your council members not necessarily feel beholden to the, the people in their community who didn't want this to happen? Because I feel like that's, that's the situation that we, we commonly face here. And I was at an event last week um, and a state senator said, elected officials are not profiles in courage, and I generally think that's true. <laughs> and so I'm just really curious about why, like why did your city council, like what, what enabled them to rise above and, and do something like this? Sure, so, so a lot of the opposition um, to the comprehensive plan came from um, the, the few voices who tend to always get heard at some of these, um, uh, when, when housing issues come up or when any kind of issues come up, there are certain people that kind of come, that gravitate towards these and, and make their voices heard. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as part of the engagement effort, the city really reached out um, to people who weren't always being heard on issues and said, hey, you know, what, what do you want things to look like rather than waiting for the feedback to come to them? Because mm -hmm. it's very easy to um, give some of this ne negative feedback or to uh, just say no to every new thing that's proposed. 
but really that's obviously just um, you know, supporting the status quo. And the city made it clear, and I think we all know that the status quo is not working and that we need some kind of uh, real solutions to this. And so I think that that's where some of the, the uh, push and pull was on, on that issue. It's hard to know if uh, the issues scale, I think, from Minneapolis to Los Angeles and our, our form of city to New York, that's for sure. But um, the conclusion I would draw from the Minneapolis case is more that we need more groups like Neighbors for na More Neighbors. I think that's more important than like reaching out to a wider part of the community. We, in Los Angeles now, we finally have advocacy groups across the city landscape for more affordable housing. And those groups really need to be encouraged, engaged, because they then counter the groups that have been so dominant in the discussion and not representative, particularly now. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to public housing, I think it's really hard to talk about public housing now when we have no public subsidy, basically. And so, um, though I would love to see a public housing advocacy group begin, um, that won't happen in my lifetime, as far as I can tell. So we're always looking for ways to do, and as I was mentioning earlier, in Los Angeles now, a unit of affordable housing costs $650,000 to build. So the amount of public subsidy we would need to make that affordable is uh, implausible to imagine you could actually meet the need with that form. Clearly, it's going to take every form of housing we can possibly produce. And if we can get subsidies for public housing, great. And we should be doing that not with new housing, but with retrofitting and all kinds of things that um, you know, would help us in production. But I think that the answers are going to lie in other, I think we have to look for other answers also um, that uh, don't demand federally supportive housing. You know, when we look back at the history of public housing in the United States, we built the same number of units as Sweden. They have seven million people in Sweden and they built a million units and that's what we built. So it's more prevalent here in New York, but it certainly hasn't made much of a dent in the whole housing picture. Um, with regard to jurisdictions, I, that's a really interesting question in my mind. Um, and, uh, you know, it's so overlaid with uh, land value, um, housing production, uh, uh, jurisdiction, regulation. Um, and so teasing those things out is always a pretty intricate, strategic move. And it varies by time. So I don't think there are single answers to that either. I mean, in California, when we were working, and, and right now, the state legislature is hot to address affordable housing across the state. And the local leaders who are supportive of affordable housing are pushing legislation up because then it can get customized as it comes back down. And that's a really effective way to work right now. I have no idea whether that will still be the case in five more years. So we're trying to jump in and get as much radical legislation. Now we're talking about minimum uh, zoning, not maximum zoning, you know, which is much denser in parts of Los Angeles than anyone would have imagined, and we're talking about it. So uh, I think the idea of like customizing at the local level and figuring out how to write policy that's better able to be customized is super interesting. Yeah, and I think something you said which is really admirable about, the, about your group is that you have these groups of people in, in many places who are Policy experts, kind of. They're not, yeah. you're, you're not traditional policy experts. Mm -hmm. And you know how to activate, and you know how to mobilize, but you're experts at policy because these issues are actually quite complicated. Even among housing advocates, for example, these jurisdictional issues are extremely complex for people to understand. Yeah, and really, I mean, when I listen to Anton talking about it, uh, I think, yeah, that's the kind of partners we need because there's a kind of, human touch on all the things that you talk about, like you're involved with it, where we sometimes, I think, in academics or in the city level, stay kind of at the more uh, bird's eye view, if not the satellite view. And that's never effective. So the other thing that works well, I think, in new strategies for making change is the flattening of what was presumed to be how 
uh, urban transformation happened. I mean, we have to be working together with groups like Neighbors for More Neighbors uh, if we're going to get anything done. Yeah, and, and part of that, too, for us is, um, you know, understanding, I mean, th certainly we have a lot of activists who uh, know, you know some things about urban planning, but um, when we're trying to have a more robust engagement experience or, or creating that, that space for people who don't know um, everything about urban planning to have that discussion and for us to kind of be there to listen to what people want, I think that's a really important space to create for other people is, you know, taking some of the, the um, privilege we have of being able to, to talk and discuss these issues and bringing in more people and saying, hey, you don't need to be an expert to know what you want your community to look like. You just need to, um, you know, ha ha help articulate it, and we can kind of help um, articulate that, uh, you know, to, to a more policy level. But bringing in more people and understanding what people are asking for of their communities is really important for us. Um, I have a question that for Fabiana and for Dana, and maybe start with Dana. Um, Fabiana said that in, you know, the strategy in New York has been to go for volume, essentially, that we have such a big need that mm -hmm. um, the city's strategy has been to go to high-density neighborhoods and build large developments. But um, I wonder, Dana, what you see as the ancillary um, advantages of incremental development um, beyond, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, beyond just the units themselves. To me, it's one of the really important untapped land use opportunities that uh, we're not very skilled at as professions, uh, either architecture or planning. It's sort of an in-between zone, which is why we ended up with lot types and uh, construction types, construction systems. Um, so for instance, if you just take the rooftops, which I know a lot of people have looked at in New York as a site, an unconventional site or less, and that we could zone those and that those could be built. One by one, they don't mean much, but when you add them up, and you, you know, in Los Angeles, we talk about trying to produce like 10,000 housing units in a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be enough. I mean, that was like one small percentage of the backyards. So it's looking for these kind of incremental conditions that proliferate wildly. That, to me, that's interesting. Instead of the kind of uh, gerrymandering of zoning or the big wide paintbrush of zoning, this is all R5, um, there are new forms of zoning, I think, that look at it in section and in plan and in you know, conditions that we could actually be using to find more housing sites. Have you <clears throat> Excuse me, have you been able to tell yet, has there been enough production yet that you can, um, and have you been able to do any analysis, whether it's affected the types of builders, for example, who are able to work on this, um, in this arena, and what about incomes to homeowner, homeowners, and yeah, has it's it affected neighborhood services and so on? Neighborhood services, you mean like utilities or? No, no. like um, stores and has oh, it engendered more transit, for example? Uh, there, as I was, uh, there are hot spots in Los Angeles where secondary units are really uh, easy to build. And those areas you can see transformations happening. Um, maybe not so much in commercial development yet, but you feel a change in the neighborhoods. Um, for the most part, it's so distributed that it actually, that's one of the effective aspects of it is that people can't quite tell it's happening, that their entire city has had, you know, its zoning changed and the, the entire state. Um, the first part of your question was, uh, oh yes, provision of services. I don't have data about that yet. Every young architect I know is working on them Everyone's having a hard time getting a builder because building is crazy at the moment. And so that's a real sticking point and it's driven the cost of secondary units up. But they're the most interesting new forms of finance provision. So uh, young architects and builders have teamed together, for instance, to 
um, standardized garage conversions, and they've gotten Silicon Valley investment capital to fund those, and they get uh, homeowners to, homeowners don't pay and don't provide any of the services. So they put the secondary unit in your backyard where your garage was, and they let you help choose the tenant. You get 25% of the rent for some number of years, and then it converts back to you. Now, the problem with that, so it's super interesting. That's just one of many examples of these kind of one-stop shops that are bubbling up. Um, the problem is those are not going to end up being affordable units. So we don't have anything called a naturally occurring affordable unit. I don't know what that is. Um, nothing like that occurs naturally. It's all expensive. It's all overpriced. And... Uh, and what, you, just to um, give us a little bit of background on that, what is pushing that? I mean, we're familiar with our growth in New York and the, um, the pressure that that's put. So is it all from population growth, or is there anything yeah. else going on? That uh, As one of my colleagues uh, in planning wrote, sprawl has hit the wall in Los Angeles. In other words, you can't grow further out. So even the outer hinterlands are now expensive. So there's not enough land and there's a lot more people. So, same as you, I think. Mm -hmm. Just that we're not on an island. Right. Um, <clears throat> one more question for you, Dana. You and um, the colleague um, Per Johan Dahl wrote something that's very provocative, which is that zoning as ideology and practice not only stands in the way of sustainable development, but prevents the next era of urbanization in which architectural approaches to this challenge are essential. Um, and then go on to say, we must demonstrate that zoning must die. Um, <laughs> so, uh, really? Uh, Isn't that what Houston is? I can't Houston remember is? what this <laughs> room is about. Houston doesn't have zoning. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, in fact, in Houston, there's effective zoning. It's by covenants, codes, and restrictions, I think. So. They actually, a few neighborhoods have had those CC and R's die, but um, yeah, I guess I say that provocatively because I really do think we need uh, to continue to explore new forms of land use uh, enablement, right? So we've always thought of it as a kind of restrictive zoning. Uh, and really, we need to be incentivizing land transformation without displacing uh, people who are vulnerable and it, at need. So I see that at, when I talk about like site identification, and I really think this is why architects and planners, it's still incredible to me that we don't work together. Um, and it's true in universities and it's true in the public sector. But the most interesting zoning changes that have happened in Los Angeles from the small lot ordinance to adaptive reuse to uh, ADUs has been partnerships between architects and planners that have gone outside standard zoning practices. And so if we don't find uh, new ways of dividing up what the existing city is, given that it's so built out already in most of our cities, I think zoning is going to remain an ineffective and restrictive tool rather than one that um, promotes innovative solutions that we desperately need. So I don't know if I say zoning should die, but you can see kind of how I got to that. Yeah. I, I think I think too. Like one thing that um, kind of resonates with certain people is that uh, so much of the of uh, the cities that we live in now were built before there there was effective zoning, um, and so um, there are several like you know when it comes to like a cute three story brownstone that was built without um, parking, for example. Mm -hmm. Like we've gone gone out and talked to people and said, hey, you know, there's a reason you don't see these anymore. It's because Zoning requires X number of parking spaces, or it requires you know this um, you know can't be over this height because you know a neighboring building is this high and, and so and you know, you know, things like that. And people kind of start to see that um, we've changed the system and it's kind of gotten a little more and more restrictive over time. Um, whereas some of the buildings that people know and love and think you know oh that's a great piece of architecture or that's a great place to live, uh, those things just aren't possible to build now. Um, so maybe one or two more questions up here, and then we'll turn it over to you all to ask questions. But 
Fabiana, um, you've been doing some work and HBD's been doing work as one of the few cities in the United States that has continued this work on fair housing mm -hmm. and um, how the city's efforts can um, foster a fairer housing system in New York. Do you wanna, um, would you talk for a little bit about how you see the kind of things that are being talked about here interacting with the, the need and the effort to um, make a fairer housing system? Yeah, I think um, we've been thinking about that issue a lot from the angle of what other opportunities does housing provide to someone beyond just like a physical shelter and that's really about neighborhood and um, neighborhood amenities and neighborhood effects on people's lives and so things like access to good schools, um, low, low crime areas, lower poverty rates, um, healthier environments. And so I think that to the extent that single family neighborhoods can provide those things is certainly a reason, certainly a fair housing issue to not exclude people from those neighborhoods and a reason to try to increase the population of those neighborhoods to open up access to those amenities, which are not necessarily concentrated in single family neighborhoods, but, but can be certainly. Um, I think the only potential issue there is um, kind of the, the public transportation access and generally this, the city is, we're not trying to add a lot of people to areas where there isn't good public transit access. Um, and that's not necessarily every single family neighborhood in New York, but, but in some of them, I think we'd have second thoughts about that. But isn't there also the um, possibility of thinking about transportation maybe in different ways that it doesn't have to be the subway. Um, it, you know, it could be bus lines or other sorts of um, transit that could help open up some neighborhoods. Yeah, I think that that's definitely true. I don't know how reliable <laughs> the bus system always is, but I think certainly that's an argument to invest in things like better, you know, bus rapid transit or you know, select bus services um, in areas that need them and would benefit actually the people who are living there already as well as, as any potential new residents. And with things like congestion pricing, which is happening, um, there's all the more reason to do that. Giampaolo, did you have, I see you writing notes. Did you have anything? To no, I always take notes. I, w I was um, feeling bad for Fabiana because um, you're kind of speaking as the representative of City of New York's policies on everything unavoidable. <laughs> I'm not a human being. <laughs> I'm just a government official. <laughs> no, I, I'd be curious to, to get to the audience. One of the, yeah, as, as you know, one of the, the things that we've been interested in at the Urban Democracy Lab has been different kinds of models of ownership, cooperative ownership. Uh, we think the limited equity cooperative experiments in New York were effective. We think community land trusts are interesting. We think there's interesting models from Europe and other places. So anyways, I, as we move into the discussion, I, I would love to talk about some of those too. So um, please come on up if you have a um, question. Yes. One, two, one, two, hi. Uh, my name is, uh, hello, hello, okay. My name is uh, Thomas Lopez Pierre and I'm a, uh, uh, private equity real estate guy um, that invests uh, in affordable housing. We raise capital exclusively from black and Hispanic investors and deploy it exclusively with black and Hispanic uh, real estate developers. Um, question in two points. One is, um, if you look at this audience, you wouldn't know it, but the city of New York is 53% black and Hispanic. And the average household income for a black and Hispanic family is about 32,000, and for a white family it's about 100,000. For the last 20 years, about 30 to 40 percent of black uh, males have dropped out of high school. And we have seen a, a city economy that is moving from um, uh, um, manual labor um, to education. And so we, in the last 20 years, we've seen an influx of white professionals flooding into New York City unable to afford to live in the Upper West Side where I live or Upper East Side or, or Tribeca. And they've been flooding into black and Hispanic neighborhoods like Harlem and Bed-Stuy. 
and landlords have been predatory in terms of pushing out the tenants um, to replace them. So my question is for the city official and for anybody else who's going to handle it. There's a, there's, a ticking, there's a ticking bomb that's going to go off. Oh, and then the other thing is that in the white population, 29% of, of white babies are born out of wedlock. In the black population, it's 73% out of wedlock. So we have this out of wedlock and failed educational system providing a very low income, broken black and Latino family that is going to be desperate um, for affordable housing. So this bomb is gonna go off by the next generation. And since the state, and I'll end here, since the state and the city has made a commitment to um, transition affordable housing via our prison system and shut that down, there's going to be a need, a desperate, desperate, desperate need for affordable housing. Oh, and I'll end by saying our corporations are desperate for talent. I was just at a major accounting firm today for a forum. Out of 400 people in the room, I was the only black person in the room. And these are all people earning good income jobs. So what is the future for New York City? When does the bomb go off? When we have a mayor that's corrupted by the real estate interests and has not been able to provide affordable housing for the black and Hispanic community? Thank you. I don't know if I know where to begin. Um, all I can say is I don't think anyone denies that gentrification is real and it's happening. And we think that the only thing that we can do about it at this point is to preserve the existing affordable housing that we have and to create as much new affordable housing as possible. That's a big part of what this administration is trying to do, as, as well as um, strengthen rent stabilization laws, which is a state issue, um, and that's something that's happening now. Um, there's almost a million rent stabilized apartments in New York City. It's a huge number. It's a huge source of affordable housing for the city. Um, over time, starting in the 1990s, those laws have been weakened, which has created a lot of um, turnover and, and loss of low-cost rent-stabilized housing and um, increase in the rents of that housing. Yeah, both, yeah. Um, displacement of, of low-income tenants from rent-stabilized housing and I guess I'm talking about turnover of the units from serving low-income people to getting deregulated. Um, and so I think that is probably the number one issue in terms of helping to keep low-income people in New York City in the neighborhoods that they want to live in. Um, and it's something that we have a huge opportunity to address right now. Um, No, of course, yeah. I, I really disagree with that. The, the majority of people who uh, enter our housing lottery and actually are awarded units, or homes, I should say, um, in our affordable housing projects are lower income people of color. Um, that, that's a fact, and I understand the optics of that are, are not always what they seem to be. Um, if I could jump in for a minute, not to take away the importance of all this at the local level. I mean, I think what you're pointing to is a, the real meaning of the housing system, mm -hmm. which, it, as you said, Fabiana, it's not about housing alone. It's a racial issue. It's an income inequality issue. Uh, it goes back to jobs. And when you start looking at the... And public schools, essential. And and the carceral state. So, you know, all of that together uh, is so daunting that I think it has often uh, been 
the tsunami that kept us from acting. And now the question in my mind is, where, do, where does each part of that system pull up its thread to start acting in ways that brings about the kind of justice you're talking about? It can't be done just through housing. It's, yeah. We read about that in LA. So I, um, not as dramatic or as immediate or as local, but um, we've talked a lot about the power of zoning. And as a planner, I think we often turn to zoning as the one thing we can do, the one thing we can tweak. And so my question is, in Minneapolis, you mentioned that the um, zoning has to follow the plan. And so my question is, how is your organization following up on that process? And I'm very a discreet question, but then more kind of to us as people living in New York State and New York City, zoning doesn't really have to follow the plan. For cities over one million, it has to follow a well-considered plan, which has no definition in state law that I found, right? You guys probably know better than I do. But, but the relationship between the legal regulatory tools that we use and the plans, I think has been a theme that I've seen or heard running through today's conversation. And so the regulations are the things we can tackle right now, but the plan and the design and the design thinking are the bigger picture of income inequality, of racism that create the demand and the housing crisis across the housing system. So how can we link, for all of you, how can we link, well, how do you, what steps can we make as a community of designers, of planners to link system questions, plan questions, design questions with regulation questions, with this policy, this law, this change right now? Thanks. And in Minneapolis, specifically. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I can talk about, um, well, I, I guess both of those um, a little bit. So the, um, the 2040, the comprehensive plan, uh, was passed in December of 2018. And it needs to go through uh, vetting at, Met, at the Met Council, which is our regional uh, body that requires these. And at that point, we will start to um, work to um, you know, or at least neighbors for more neighbors is you know planning on making sure that, that these things are followed through on properly because yeah it, it doesn't help if um, if we're you know uh, creating this this uh, long term plan but the short term um, you, we we know that opponents uh, you know tried to water down the plan initially and they'll try to water down the the zoning as well to uh, accommodate themselves and to make sure that uh, as, as little housing gets built as possible. Um, I just blanked on the second part of your question. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, sorry. I, I just had one thing, and I'll I'll let kind of other people talk to that because I think that they can probably be more experts than I am. Um, but uh, if you if you do look out if you go to uh, Minneapolis2040.org. I think it is. We have a big list of um, we categorize things into goals and topics and uh, actual policies. And it was kind of a, a unique way of tying a lot of these things together because I think it is it's a comprehensive approach. I mean, housing is not going to solve all the other issues that are out there, but we do need to take it within the context of all the other issues that are out there in terms of uh, transportation, uh, criminal justice, and that sort of thing. And so while some of those things were outside the scope of Minneapolis 2040, uh, they certainly were a part of the discussion and part of the uh, important context of uh, the, the comprehensive plan. I just wanted to say one thing towards that, that one of the, um, maybe the most admirable 
thing, actually, and learning from the Minneapolis example is the uh, capacity of the city to articulate collective goals. It, we are not able, seemingly, in New York to really do that. We, we don't, for one thing, have a, any sort of mandate to have a comprehensive plan, but I think it's something more um, essential and, um, and political than that, that we have not, for it seems like quite a long time, been able to really um, articulate a set of collective priorities and then figure out the, the strategies by which we're going to um, get to those. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, I'm, not, I'm the least technical person on this panel, so I'll give you an abstract answer, which is I have the opportunity when I work with Right to the City and, and meet housing advocates and meet activists in different cities, I get the opportunity to meet people who are fighting for seemingly small things, so people in Richmond, California, fighting for rent control, fighting for just cause laws, fighting for uh, the emergency fund uh, to protect against eviction and those kinds of things. And it's a piece, it's a tiny piece of a thing that they recognize as part of a very big set of interlocking problems. So racism, inequalities in the market, failing education system, all these problems. And I think somehow it's about power, it's about politics, and it's about articulating big goals as you make small changes, not substituting one for the other. So when they win a rent control regulation or a just cause, it's not an, an end to itself. It's part of a bigger thing, but somehow, you know, I see it kind of like the Minneapolis folks. It's problem solving and big picture at the same time. And, and I think maybe you're right, in New York, maybe, maybe we have a difficulty articulating that. Um, one last question, and then unfortunately we need to leave the auditorium. Okay, well this is a somewhat dated question, though I think we're still living uh, its repercussions. But my understanding is that the Bloomberg up zonings and down zonings has had the net effect of increasing housing capacity by 1.7%. Why wasn't there a push to increase density throughout the city, and what's the city's current stance towards ADUs? And is there much coordination between HPD and planning? Um, I can't speak for, for Bloomberg, but certainly during that administration, certain areas were upzoned and certain areas were downzoned, um, which was not necessarily a good thing. But, um, sorry, your question was about uh, coordination. What, or uh, if, if you want to uh, take uh, the current administration, what, what is your stance towards ADUs and increasing density throughout the city? I think that's something that we feel, at, ADUs, as, as far as I know, we don't have a strong position on it. I think it's something that if there was like a, a local will to do it in certain communities, I think that would certainly be something that we would pay attention to. Um, and I haven't personally seen that, um, the demand for that in, in neighborhoods where that could be a possibility. Um, I don't know if that's because people don't want them or they don't have enough awareness that that's something that they could do. Um, and your other question? Uh, is there much coordination between HPD and planning? Because the Department of City Planning? Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, they, they control and, and regulate zoning. Um, recently, you know, more recently, a lot of the zoning code has incorporated measures to create affordable housing. So we actually have something called mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, which requires a certain level of, of affordable homes um, in new developments. Um, and so I think we see our functions as being, you know, inherently linked, probably more than they have been in the past. But could always be better, I'm sure. There clearly is, um, all, there are, are all kinds of questions um, still to be explored on this um, topic and the possibilities of densifying this city, which we always think of as one of the densest cities um, in the country, country but there's um, plenty of area to densify. Um, thank you very, very much to our 
our presenters and panelists. Um, and thank you all for coming. And please come back next week um, for new technologies and new <clears throat> new technologies and new materials on the 30th. Thank you.